Hey, it's Mazzy. Welcome back. I want to showcase a record that I haven't played in 48 years, a double record album, which was a soundtrack to a movie in 1976. And um, I have a section here in my Beatle wall here. There's one cube, cube and a half, that has a lot of records of Beatle covers, people covering the Beatles of the entire album are Beatles songs from Count Basie to Chet Atkins to Blossom Deary to George Martin and his orchestra to many others, uh, the Chipmunks, <laughs> so, so many others. And there's several soundtracks. Some are extremely bad. Uh, Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now, this is not the soundtrack I'm talking about. This is talk about a career, uh, <laughs> a career killer. Uh, Peter Frampton uh, will phone you. The Bee Gees will phone you uh, after peaks of both these artists. This is kind of George Burns. I mean, it didn't quite kill him yet. This is a promo copy I got. And I saw a um, a screening of this. We got free tickets uh, during my record store days. But this isn't even the record I'm going to show you. But it reminded me to pull this out. Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band. Terrible movie. Uh, <laughs> the Bee Gees. Steve Martin. Billy Preston. Alice Cooper knew this was bad karma doing this piece of crap. Again, promo copy there. But um, I was inspired to do this video and to pull this record out because of Steve Gutenberg, the audiophiliac. If you don't know who Steve Gutenberg is, you should, because uh, he used to be the correspondent, the AV correspondent for CNET, and he's been on his own for many years now. He has a YouTube channel, huge, massive channel and uh, every few days he does these um these some, sometimes gear reviews sometimes he talks about records but it's mostly gear related speakers and turntables and all the you know hazari uh in terms of uh his knowledge he used to be in the audio business as a salesperson and um i want to show you this one clip he just reviewed a turntable, a Techniques New 1200G, I think it is. It's sort of a home version, a cleaner version of their famous 1300, the DJ turntable, direct drive turntable. Now, I'm not here to talk about gear, but I was kind of interested. Um, it's like a $3,400 turntable opposed to the 40. Anyway, that's not what this is about. But let me kind of show you. I'll put a link below to his channel and this particular video because I'd say halfway through it or two thirds of the way through, he talks about uh, what he played. He played some old Stones records on the turntables and some other things, but he talks about this record. It was even more apparent when I played this long forgotten album, forgotten by me and many other people, all this and World War II. And this is a movie soundtrack and it's all Beatles songs. It's kind of like Across the Universe movie, but years earlier, this is from 1976. I looked around, I couldn't find it streaming on Kobuz or Tidal, maybe Spotify. So anyway, you get the idea. I'll put a link below if you want to watch this review in this video. But it got me thinking, because he uses to test a turntable with various cartridges. And uh, I haven't played this record literally in 48 years when I got it. Um, we probably played it in the store. I played it at home once, and that was it. So I pull it out. It's a double album. Here is the slip case. There you go. I'll, I'm going to go through a lot of these tracks and these artists because this was really interesting. Uh, it's a double gatefold that goes into the slipcase. It has all your artists listed here. Now, the film is terrible. It's almost like rotoscope versions uh, with screen effects of World War II footage matched to Beatles songs. I saw this movie. It was It's terrible. The movie bombed badly. It, in fact, I think the studio pulled it after two weeks. I think the soundtrack made more money. Uh, than the film. And of course, it has a booklet with all the lyrics and features uh, the artist, showcases the artist here. Uh, this was put together by a producer named Lou Reisner. I don't know who he is, but apparently the year after this, he died in his 40s. So this wasn't a good karma for him. But he worked with a guy named Will Malone, a British uh, um, arranger who orchestrated with the London Symphony Orchestra. And that does... I'd say 95% of the backing is this huge orchestra. Now, for a little backdrop, before I get to that, several years earlier, they did something similar. This orchestral version of Tommy. This is Tommy 
with the London Symphony Orchestra and Chamber Choir and guest soloists. And all these artists are on here. This is not the movie version of the, uh, the Russell film. Uh, this is a standalone record. Pete Townsend had something to do with it and all these artists. And it's the same type of thing. Now, apparently this guy, um, Reisner, also worked on... Um, what, Journey to the Center of the Earth, Rick Wakeman. So he has this kind of a rock orchestral uh, emphasis background. And apparently he, he produced the first two Rod Stewart records. I did not know that. I didn't know anything about that. So anyway, that's, uh, and I could talk about this album, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. I think this won a, uh, a Grammy for Best Design at the time. Um, remember Tommy? Remember this? There's some good things on here, but the trouble with these kind of records there's always gems, and there's a lot of terrible crap on these things. So I just kind of wanted to talk about it. Now, my copy of all this in World War II still has the slick, so I wonder if I can get this T-shirt. How much is the T-shirt? $4.50 plus 75 cent postage. T-shirts were, were cheap then, about the price of an album. Now, this is a double album with a major book. So let me say this. I played this whole album from top to bottom. And I'll tell you this, this is an incredibly sounding record. My pressing is pristine. I probably just played it once back in 1976. It's quiet. It's dynamic. The London Orchestra is the major part of that. lays the foundation uh, behind all these solo artists. And uh, they're the backup to, what, 98% of this. There's a, a track or two that is separate that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and Will Malone, uh, I guess, arranged and orchestrated this. There is sort of a backup band on a lot of it, including the great piano player, Nicky Hopkins. So uh, it, you can't go wrong when you have Nicky Hopkins playing piano and being the main uh, piano player on here. And just a, a cavalcade of artists. Now, the trouble with these kind of records, too, in the 1970s, they would bring on these artists who had major hits in the moment. So if the artist didn't last a much beyond a one or two or three hit wonder, you know, you look back and you think, really? That person? Plus, they took artists from an earlier generation, like in that Sgt. Pepper soundtrack, George Burns. Well, here we have a few of the previous generation of musicians mixed in with musicians of the day. But I tell you, this was a gorgeous sounding record with my Hannah MC cart, my Riga turntable, my setup, my Hegel H390 system. It sounded friggin' amazing. Now, not every track was great, but the orchestration was lush. It is a louder orchestration. It's not like background music. It's a big part is like like a classical soundtrack, which is really pretty much what it is. But let me go through this. Um, there is a booklet with all the lyrics. Again, the movie was terrible and movie bombed. It opens up with the band, the American rock, hard rock, little progish band called Ambrosia doing Magical Mystery Tour. Actually, not a bad version. I kind of liked it. Now you have a little these little pictures of each band. Uh, there's Ambrosia. I have no Ambro Ambrosia albums. Then it goes into the highlight of this album, which was a hit two years prior to this. So this is the one song, I think the only song that wasn't recorded for all this in World War uh, II. And that is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by Elton John. What a great verse. That was a number one hit in America. A huge hit. That's when John Lennon, as uh, Winston O'Boogie, sings the reggae chorus harmony with Elton John. I think it's a great version. It's that bombastic, beautiful uh, drum sound of um, was it of, of uh, Nigel Olson, produced by um, Gus Dudgeon, who produced all these great 70s, 1970s Elton John records. Uh, this is around the time, I guess, of uh, Brown Dirt Cowboy. Fan fantastic version and on this pressing on this Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds sounds great so Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is the only song I believe that is taken from previous uh, recording but it fits perfectly in and it, it I, I really liked it and I blasted this record I really cranked it then it goes into Golden Slumbers Carry That Weight by the Bee Gees now the Bee Gees you know 
should I cut their losses after this instead of doing that Sgt. Pepper two years later? They actually sound really good. Again, the lush orchestration around, and of course, you know, boy, you carry that weight. You're going to carry that weight. You got to carry that weight. You know the lyrics to the Beatles song from Abbey Road, a beautiful version. Again, I would say the key word I'm going to say throughout this is lush. Beautiful London Symphony Orchestra recordings and beautiful recorded harmonies and nice arrangements. It's not a replacement, obviously, for the Beatles, but in that 70s period that we're longing for the Beatles. And remember, 76, the punk thing was starting to happen. So, uh, you know, that's another reason. I, I think, you know, I think it did okay here. Uh, but, um, you know, not super hit. You know, this was a cutout uh, in the cutout bins uh, for a long time uh, afterwards. These records were cheap. You probably can get it cheap now. I would say if you want a good sounding record and you see a copy, you just pick it up, enjoy it for what it is. Not every song is great. Not every artist works, as I said. Now, uh, several artists have several tracks, the Bee Gees, and this was a surprise for me. Leo Sayer. Remember, I Feel Like Dancing? How, what's the song? Um, I did, did feel like dancing, which is great. I tell you, he was one of my favorite. I think he does three tracks on here, and here he does I Am The Walrus. He's got some chops, man. He kicks it up several notches, plus he has a little bit of this soulful, blue-eyed, soulful gospel thing going on a couple, of, uh, at least on one of the songs he sings. I was really impressed with Leo Sayer. Feel Like Dancing? What's the song? The Blue Cover? I, used to, I think I want to find that album. It's probably cheap again. I used to have it, and I don't have it anymore. And I want to see if I like him still. I mean, that seemed a little gimmicky, that hit uh, single to me, but he kicks it on here. Next is a beautiful, lush version of She's Leaving Home by Brian Ferry, of course. He's still in the midst of, um, of Roxy Music here at this point. He is uh, doing his solo albums, and his solo albums were basically just all covers. Anyway, rock and roll covers. So he does a beautiful version here. Uh, again, Lush, Symphony Orchestra, you know, there are bands here, but it's well arranged. But uh, Brian, I always like Brian Ferry's voice. So the, there you got Brian Ferry right there. Then next is an unlikely uh, selection, maybe not for the 1970s, but you got Lovely Rita, by Roy Wood. Of course, Roy Wood from The Move and Wizard. And it's a fun version. It's, um, you know, he can get very poppy, as you know, when he wants to. His, his great, you know, Christmas single he had with Wizard. Um, I like Roy Wood. Of course, I love The Move. So that was, that was fun. Um, none of these are definitive versions, really, but they're, they're fun alternatives, and they sound really good. Steve Gutenberg, thank you. If you're watching this, which you're probably not, thank you. You reminded me to pull a record from this wonderful archive I have and enjoy it. I, I want to play this again. You know, I blasted it. Now, then you got the novelty. And the person who was on that, who, was he on this one? Or is in the movie, definitely. He's probably on that one, too. I don't even remember now. You got Keith Moon, obviously. The, the quirky, wonderful drummer of The Who. Keith and I share the same birthday, doing When I'm 64, which is, you know, obviously a campy song to begin with. Um, novelty in a way, old thing in a way. Doesn't add anything new. He does his kind of uh, shtick, his Keith Moon shtick, When I'm 64. It, it, he's the original Uncle Ernie, as we know. But um, <laughs> not fiddling about here, When I'm 64. So I'm not going to say that is successful. But it's interesting nonetheless. Then you got Rod Stewart. Now, I mentioned Rod Stewart. Uh, his first two albums were produced by Lou Reisner, unbeknownst to me. He does a really good version of um, Get Back. Now, it again, it's with orchestra, but, it, you know, he can rock it out. He, when he does covers around this time, in the 70s, you know, he was high on it high on the hog and doing great stuff on Warner Brothers Records. Do you think I'm sexy? Is that this? Is that a couple years later in 78? But, you know, he was selling records in the 70s. I think this is just after, um, a couple years after he uh, the faces broke up. But uh, he does a kind of a good version there. Of course, uh, Rod Stewart doing uh, Get Back. You know, a, a perfect song for him. Nothing essential uh, in his version of it or nothing totally original. But um, good. 
Then I'm going to go back again. We come back to Leo Sayer doing a version of a Let It Be. And it's a kind of a, it starts out with this is piano alone, and then the strings come in. Uh, but it's it's a gospel-y thing. Again, I don't know why, but I was more impressed with Leo Sayer on this album than almost anyone else, because I didn't expect it. I think that's why. Expectations were not high with me hearing three Leo Sayer songs on this record. But I quite liked all three of them. Then you got an okay version of an artist that I really like that some people consider him a one-hit wonder. And one of my favorite songs in the 1970s was Rock On by David Essex. Billie Jean, that bass on that song. Great album. I love that album. The whole album doesn't work, but I like the record. Of course, he was in the film That'll Be the Day with Ringo Starr and then the sequel Stardust, which I don't know if it's even available. I would like to have that on video. I haven't seen it since it uh, came out in, I'm thinking, 75-ish or so. But uh, he does Yesterday. Now, Yesterday is one of those songs so many people have covered Yesterday. He does a good version of it. I, I think the arrangement is the weak part. His voice is great. But I tell you, when I listen to a record like this, and I like Leo Sayer more than I like David Essex, something's going on here. Uh, so there's David Essex there. You know, pretty boy, uh, great vocalist, got a kind of a soulful British sound as well. I like that. Then you got a medley with the guy that always wanted to be a Beatle, and he almost became a Beatle. He didn't become a Beatle, but he became a Wilbury as Jeff Lynne. Of course, ELO was riding high here, and he does a medley with a little help from my friends, going into Nowhere Man, going back into with a little help from my friends. Uh, the ever-sunglassed singer. What's great about this, well, I tell you what I love about this, when you listen to ELO records, the way he likes to record his records, they're very compressed, right? This is great. So it's not compressed. Again, that lush strings, but not the ELO type of thing. So thank God he didn't produce it. Thank God it was consistent with the rest of this record. But I like it. You know, nothing earth-shaking, but I like it. Now, then a very lush, beautiful, romantic because. Now, because... Uh, you know, the harmonies on that by the Beatles are sublime, and you can never replace the Beatles version from Abbey Road. But you have Lindsay DePaul, who I had never heard of. I looked the people up here. She was a British singer and writer, had some hits around this time. I realized that a lot of the people that I wasn't really familiar with had very recent hits just prior to the making of this album. So they used kind of the flavor of the month. Although, I heard she was she came in second one year on the um, Eurovision song uh, song contest uh, with a, a vocal of her. So you in the British uh, world, there you in the UK might recognize Lindsay DePaul. Don't know her, didn't know her before. This is like story time from Mazzy, isn't it? Thank you, Steve Gutenberg, the audiophiliac. Now we got the Mee Gees again, the, the Mee Gees, the Bee Gees again, which she came in through the bathroom window. All right. Next. You got, okay, this is interesting. I had no idea who this was. And it starts out with, this is a Michelle, and it's this, over, this French Italian singer, Michelle, my belle sente moi, qui vont très bien ensemble, très bien ensemble. You like my accent there, my my pronunciation of, of French? That's French. Uh, that Paul uh, had someone help him write back in uh, Rubber Soul days. Now, Richard Cociante, this French-Italian singer, never heard of him in my entire life, uh, had a lot of hits, worldwide hits, pop, Italian, French, pop singer, apparently had a big hit, the year before this, maybe that's why he's on here. Never heard of him my entire life. Um, but then it builds up to this crescendo of the center part of that song. Eh. Next, we'll phone you. Now, we can work it out by the four seasons. Remember way back, VJ Records put that comp out, the, sort of a comp of introducing the Beatles or another variation, the Beatles version of the four seasons? Who do you think won that one? back in 1964. Well, we got the Four Seasons doing We Can Work It Out. And um, I realized this is the year after their comeback single, 
uh, December 1963. Remember that song? Late December back in 63. That's my, my version of uh, Four Seasons. Eh, we'll phone you. Then we got, okay, this actually I kind of like, but remember how hot on the charts Helen Reddy was in the mid-70s? I am woman, hear me roar. She sings The Fool on the Hill, and actually she 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 makes it work. It works for her. She's got a great voice. You know, I've never been like a Helen Reddy fan, but she was massive on Capitol Records. She was huge. Uh, I never owned one of her records. I don't even have the single of I Am Woman. I kind of want it. Uh, but um, there you go, Helen Reddy. Blurred. <laughs> I'm amused. I hope you are too. I hope, I'm glad you're here for the ride of this. All this in World War II, the Beatles. Now, okay, then we go to one that I totally forgot about this guy. And this guy was massive. He had... He was massive for decades, but not for our generation. We knew him. We didn't really follow him, I think. I mean, I'm saying we. I, I hate to say we because I always get pissed when people say we like this or we don't like that. Don't speak for everyone, Maslov. Here, okay. Frankie Lane doing Maxwell Silver's Hammer. Maxwell Silver Hammer, okay. Maxwell's Silver Hammer, Frankie Lane. Now, if you don't know Frankie Lane by name, those of you of a certain generation will remember it. He's one of those guys that sang a handful of cowboy westerns in the 1960s. Rawhide, moving up, moving up, shaking up, da -da 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 -da. Raw, that was Frankie Lane. He had a lot of other hits too, not just the cowboy stuff. Um, but Frankie Lane doing a version of, of Maxwell Silverhammer. Yeah, you know, but again, where do they drag him up for this? He must have owed something. Now, what they should have done on here, uh, next is Hey Jude by the Brothers Johnson. They should have got more soul artists. There's two R&B artists. And this is a good version. It doesn't kick ass. Uh, cut to Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band soundtrack two years later. One of the greatest songs on there is Earth, Wind, and Fire's version of um, Got to Get You Into My Life. I knew it was one of those songs there. Okay, great version on that. Big hit for Earth, Wind, and Fire. But the Brothers Johnson version, of course, uh, you know, they um, had a hit with Strawberry 23, the, um, the wonder, wonderful um, Otis's son's, uh, Johnny, not Johnny Otis's son, um, Shuggy Otis, uh, great song. Roy Wood comes back with Polythene Pam. Not bad. Now, this is a good version. Sun King, which is beautiful harmonies, the Bee Gees. Of course, you have the brother Gibbs doing a harmony on uh, Here Comes the Sun King. Lush, again, great version of it. Love that. Then we get into this whole whole thing of World War II. I just don't even like to see a swastika on anything. But that is about World War II. And I, I don't remember what the connection was and why this movie, this concept was so terrible to make a movie with Beatles songs and World War II footage. I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, but you got Status Quo doing Get It Better, Getting Better. Uh, not a bad version of it. And of course, Status Quo... My favorite thing is in the 60s when they were more pop psychedelic with uh, Matchstick Men. What a great single that was. Then it became more hard rock in the 70s. And I never really followed them, but you got status quo there. You know, a good version of it. But then you got, again, my buddy here, Leo Sayer. I, I should be dancing. That's the Bee Gees. But, you know, what's that blue song? Don't make me feel like dance, whatever it's called. The Long and Winding Road, pretty good version of it. But Leo Sayer, again, he is, uh, he's the, he's the, the secret, the secret formula. Here's, he's like the, what, what's the word I'm thinking of? He's the guy on this record. Now, then we got a guy who I had no idea who this guy was. Henry Gross does help. Now, I found out that Henry Gross had been the guitar player in Sha Na Na until 1970, then went solo. He had one hit the year uh, prior to this or the year of recording of this. And I think he's still alive, but um, I don't even know who that is, Henry Gross. So uh, it's okay, not a great version. Now, historically, the version here of Strawberry Fields, this is Peter Gabriel. Now, this is two years after Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. It turns out this solo effort, and he double tracks his voice, and he uses that theatrical voice of his that he used on uh, Lamb, um, most of Lamb. 
This was the first solo release ever. He wouldn't put a solo album out to, I think, the year after this, 77 or 78. This is 76. So this is the first released solo record, as far as I know, unless some uh, Peter Gabriel Genesis fan will uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But his version here of Strawberry Fields, he does some double tracking. It's really interesting. It, 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 it's nowhere near the Beatles version of Lennon and all that. But um, it is a really interesting version. Then you get into... Frankie Valley, A Day in the Life, <laughs> next, with the orchestration. And instead of the big chord at the end with the symphony, there's an acoustic guitar strum. Now, next we have something that's worth the price of admission here, I think, is uh, Tina Turner doing Come Together. Now, she does a great version, again, with the orchestration. It's, it's one of the more rockin' uh, songs on this record. Of course, earlier in 1970, uh, they had a hit. Ike and Tina Turner had a hit. They did a live version, then a studio version that seemed live version of Come Together. So she had recorded this before. But um, that is a good version. Wasn't she the Acid Queen and Tommy too? So you got some repeat performers on this and the Tommy movie. I think on the other Tommy thing. I, I, I'm confused here. I'm confused here. So we're almost finished. Don't worry. Okay, then we got the worst thing on the album. We got You Never Give Me Your Money by Will Malone and Lou Reisner. Basically, the orchestrator, whose voice is terrible, and Lou Reisner the, does a thing like almost through one of vocoders, like with Peter Frampton used to blow through, that kind of thing. Obviously, the guy's not a singer, but he wanted to sing on this, so they made uh, that sound, but um, terrible, terrible. And it ends with the end, the end. Of course, you have the atomic bomb there. With, what the... God, kind of not really an upbeat uh, storyline here. Uh, this, that's just the London Symphony Orchestra. Again, the recording of this, the sound of this record is stunning. I loved playing this. Again, some songs work better than others. I think next time I play it, if I play it uh, before, you know, sooner than 48 more years, uh, I'll enjoy it more because I know what to expect. I was anticipating what the song was going to sound like. But I'd say about a third of this record is solid, maybe even half. Um, and again, really well-recorded, well-mastered, well-pressed, all this and World War II. This is on 20th Century Fox Records. Uh, that's the original pressing. My guess is there was only one pressing. Anyway, there's huge stars. There's Elton John and great people playing on this record and the London Philharmonic. Now, normally that kind of like sludges things up, but not in this case. It really just gave the arrangements of these Beatles songs so much more move, room to move. And it's a really dynamic recording. Uh, I picked this up for a dollar. A dollar! Because nobody cares about this album. But now... It's one of those forgotten gems. I forgot about it. And now I'm playing the hell out of it because it's so good. Now you know about it. Now you're going to play your copy. Thank you, Steve Gutenberg. Thank you for watching a half hour. All this and World War II covers of the Beatles. Mazzy loves you.